Good day, everyone. Welcome to this uh, FCA Character Coach Sports Chaplain um, Zoom meeting. We're excited to have you today as we approach Christmas. Everybody's jacked up and uh, Eric's wearing his Chiefs gear along with a Santa hat. And um, in keeping with that, Eric, would you please uh, pray to start things off this morning, sir? The honor, Roger. Thank Good morning, you. everybody. Heavenly Father, we approach a throne of grace. Uh, thank you for mercy. Thank you for your loving kindness that's better than life. And in this season, Lord, in all of our spending, may we make time to spend sitting with you, Jesus, and hearing from you and getting direction from you in all that we do. And we thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, your loving kindness that's truly better than life. Mm -hmm. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Central focus of today's chat will be about baseball. Kids like me grew up loving baseball and loving the St. Louis Cardinals and loving all of those things. And then some people are Cubs fans anyway. I just ah. don't understand that. And it just doesn't make sense. But uh, anyway, there's a lot of us uh, grew up loving baseball and it's the thrill of our lives to be able to do ministry in baseball now. It's funny, growing up as a kid, dreaming about being a major league baseball player and never coming close never but now to be able to work alongside professional baseball players in in the service that we do is is it's a gas for a 64 year old guy just to be in that environment and love those guys and to experience just a little bit of their lives is is full of joy and and uh, fulfillment and two of our guests today are out have long histories in baseball and in baseball ministry and so I'm going to ask them to uh, do a quick introduction and a little bit of their, their history in baseball and baseball ministry, uh, those being Tom Roy and well as, um, good grief, Randy Curlis. Um, let's start with Tom. Uh, Tom, tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, background in baseball, and a little bit about your ministry life in baseball. All right, real quick, uh, oldest of eight kids when I grew up just outside of Milwaukee. Signed with the Giants when I was 17, never made it to the big leagues, uh, came to faith after that. Hmm. So I have a wife and two daughters, as well as six grandchildren, and they're little ones, you know, uh, one of them 6'5", 340, uh, the other is wow. a football player also at uh, 6'2", 225, but he's only 15, so he'll get bigger. And uh, lastly, for 38 years, I was uh, honored and humbled to serve as the founder of UPI, and we directly work with Major League Baseball, actually all levels of baseball. Mm -hmm. And uh, the purpose there is to uh, train for the purpose of sending these players. So I've had the privilege of taking many Major League and Minor League players on missions trips to 68 countries. That's a oh, quick Wow. That's awesome. And so for a whole bunch of years, you've been serving in that capacity. That's really good. 38. Yeah, I retired from that in two years ago and then started another thing called Shepherd Coach Network, trying to deal more with coaches and retired players. Outstanding. Very good. Randy, tell us a little bit about your life in baseball. Well, I'm one of those that Roger just described as growing up uh, a Cardinal fan, grew up here in St. Louis. Forget this, be like Mike. It was be like Bob. Bob Gibson <laughs> was my idol growing up playing baseball, trying to have my pitching motion just like his. Uh, played through high school, uh, not good enough to play in college. Uh, I'm one of those that I've jokingly said that my favorite verse in the Bible is Matthew 29 1, where there is no ball, I perish. And uh, <laughs> I've actually had people look it up and come back to me and say, hey, it's not my Bible. How come? I think, come on. There's no Matthew 29. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> so um, uh, I was very involved in Fellowship of Christian Athletes. My dad and I actually started it at the high school when I went to, uh, yeah. which was a brand new high school when I went there. Very involved in sports and everything, uh, especially baseball. Uh, it, was, uh, it was in February of 1999. I was walking to our Sunday night church service at First Baptist Harvester, a suburb here in St. Louis. And uh, a missionary from Venezuela who was uh, living in our missionary house. Uh, said, you know, there's this brand new minor league baseball team coming to your city. Hmm. And um, 
have you ever heard of it? I said, yeah, kind of vaguely. He goes, do you might chance know somebody who might prayerfully, possibly, wishfully, hopefully, possibly, prayerfully, maybe be their team chaplain? I said, heck yeah, I know somebody. And he said, well, 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 who? I said, me, where do I sign up? I don't got to pray about this one. <laughs> and, um, and so I didn't know that one of the things he did in Venezuela as a missionary we, during winter ball, he's a chaplain down there, was affiliated with Baseball Chapel and uh, put me in contact with them. And a uh, whole lot of stories there about getting in the f- side door initially, but uh, mm-hmm. got in finally got in, was the chaplain with their team for uh, 21 years. Uh, the team went out of business, so to speak, a year ago, uh, uh, September. And uh, fortunately, we went out as champions. And so that was, uh, that was nice and got a ring and everything. About 10 years ago, uh, the Frontier League, which is what the Rascals are in, uh, asked me to be uh, a coordinator for one of the divisions. And so they, um, I've been doing that. And then when the team folded, they asked me uh, to be the coordinator for the entire league, which now has 15 teams, which will have more than that once we get the season started. Mm-hmm. And uh, an opportunity of now uh, kind of a transition in my life, not being a chaplain of one team, but being kind of the, as a, uh, uh, Tom was talking about kind of the coach of all of them, so to speak. And so glad to have guys like Roger to, to, to be a part of that. Um, married, have a uh, 30-year-old daughter who lives with us and her son, seven years old, wow. uh, who I go to school with every day mm. uh, online to help uh, him get through school each day. So um, it's a wide variety of things and very glad to have an opportunity as roger said you know not good enough to play but boy and have an opportunity of reaching guys through baseball awesome very good as you're um participating by watching um from wherever you are rack up your questions you can either put them in the chat at the bottom and i'll read them to to our guests or if you want i'll open mics later and we can uh, chat and ask answer your questions that you may ask want to ask directly of these guys as we talk about ministry and baseball. All right, fellas, let me ask you first, are there unique challenges that come along with ministry and baseball? What are some of those unique challenges? I know for me personally, no, 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 Tom, no, no, no. You go, you go, fired up, have some more coffee. Let's get her done. (laughs) I hate, actually, I hate coffee, by the way. I, I can tell you probably the most unique challenge at least for me in baseball is dealing with the concept of failure. Mm. It's amazing that in baseball, if you fail 70% of the time, you're an Mm all-star. And so, you know, guys who, you know, go, you know, 10 at bats, 15 at bats, 20 at bats without getting a hit or getting on base, boy, the pressure begins to mount and they, and, and, and they can feel that. And so, you know, that to me, there, there are a lot of them, but that, that to me is kind of the unique one in baseball, the, uh, the, the dealing with the failure aspect. Yep. Good. Tom. Well, at the major league level, I think there are three access, trust, temptation. Mm. I think that uh, first of all, to get access to them gets tougher and tougher every year because now with COVID that just really canceled everything. So you had to be creative. Uh, trust, man. They want to know why you want to know them. Yep. And if they don't trust you, it's over. And so you have to show them that you care about them. I have some ideas on that down the road here, but then temptation, especially at that level, they're all of a sudden uh, in this dream environment, traveling all the time in hotels, all kinds of things going on. And to let them know that God loves them, kind of like Randy was saying, no matter what their performance is, that uh, whether it's on the field or off the field and then dealing with some of those life issues. You bet. I mean, even standing at a a frontier league, rather low level of baseball, but it's still professional baseball. And every time I go to meet a new player, I can always feel a little bit of what is it you want from me at first, every single time that, that same matter of trust is there. Wouldn't you say Randy, when you first meet players, Oh, no doubt. And, uh, it, 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 and, and it's, and as Roger knows, especially in our league, the, the, the transition, some guys you're going to have for a whole season, few seasons, you might have a guy for a day or two yeah. and they might get called up by somebody or they might get released. And so, um, it's like, yeah. And, but boy, I, 
I tell you what, when they see that you're there and that you care about more than this, them as a baseball player and them as a person, it's amazing how the guards begin to come down. Mm -hmm. But you're right. I, Good. I would, Tom? Also, I would also say look for a man of favor. And what yeah. I mean by that is a clubby. They're, they're there all the time. Players get traded. The clubby, mm -hmm. the owner would be awesome if you became friends with them or had trust with them. But also a player, because in the big leagues, especially when guys come up and down, it's really cool to have trust built because somebody that's been there says, I trust this guy. And uh, you can't beat that. Other than obviously the Holy Spirit, he can beat all of that. But uh, I think that that's very important. Absolutely. And I think along that kind of along that kind of line, boy, tenure tenure matters, because a new guy comes in and he might have a kind of a you know a, a hands on a hands off approach, but one of the other players, no, no, that's that's our rev. He'll out there. He'll be out here hitting fungos. He'll be cheering for your stands. You can't miss his voice. And when other players kind of back you up, then no, that that goes a long way. Yes, sir. I'm going to back. <laughs> Thanks, Randy. Uh, I had, a, uh, you know, I was a chaplain for the White Sox. I did that for four or five years. We had one player who was a believer mm -hmm. and we would pray in the sauna and hope no one <laughs> turned on while we were in there. Of course, I didn't use that, but uh, other players saw that. And then all of a sudden, another Christian player came on board and now there were three and then it just kind of spread. And we'd have uh, some days up to 16 guys come to chapel. That didn't mean they were believers, but they yeah. trusted those leading influences. That's it. And that concept of finding the man of peace is a huge thing. And who knows? It may come, like you said, from the clubhouse manager. They know everything, by the way. That's a good relationship to build because they know stuff nobody else knows. And then, or it's often a player, maybe even be the manager. I've built a great relationship with our manager. And there've been multiple times he says, Hey, Raj, um, keep an eye on this guy. We're going to release him later today. You might hang around kind of close because this is going to be a tough afternoon, stuff like that. He would trust me enough with inside information to, because he knew I'd care about the guy and, and really try to serve him. Other thoughts that you guys think are unique challenges to serving well. Yeah, I don't know about unique necessarily, but I would say the most, well, I mean, but if not the most important one of them, and we've kind of hit it all around it, is that word relationship. Mm -hmm. When those guys know that you are there not just on Sunday in baseball to do a chapel, and they don't see you till the next Sunday home game, mm -hmm. but they see you out there. Mm -hmm. And when, when you're out there and intermingling amongst them and just kind of hanging around, that ministry of hanging out, Mm -hmm. baseball is huge in that because it's an everyday kind of game versus, you know, football once a week, other sports, maybe two or three times a week, baseball, it's every day. And when they see you out there cheering for them, helping them, encouraging them, they're a whole lot more responsive in that kind of vein. Mm -hmm. And, and at, at the big league level, uh, just thinking of the challenge, it's the everyday player. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of pitchers that don't throw every day or they're on a schedule. And so you find that you have, if there are believers, there are more opportunity. You need to be sensitive to the schedule because these guys literally work a second shift job. They get off exactly. at 1030, 11 at night. They don't get to bed till two, even if they're good guys. And so they sleep till noon. And now to expect them to come to something at noon or 1230 is you, you know, you have to be flexible, just like any missionary. You got to be flexible. Yep. That's you. I usually, my first thought with them is I'm going to show up at BP. We'll talk at BP. And I say, if we were going to do a Bible study, what time should it be? And they tell me I need to fit their schedule, not have them fit mine. Right. Things of that nature. Good. All right. Now tell me, what are some of the unique opportunities that come along with ministry and baseball? Um, one other challenge I just wanted to bring up is that Randy alluded to is the constant turnover in uh, relationships. And that's, you, you're building something with a, a player or a coach or whoever, and all of a sudden he's gone. And that just, the, the, the stop in the middle of that just wears me out sometimes. Cause I think I see some progress and I have to, where did he go? And I, I'll try to connect with somebody at the next sta station and say, hey, this guy's coming to you. And I, 
we were making some progress, but I don't know what's happened yet. You guys experienced that as well? Oh my, yes. And uh, I guess one of the things nice now about quote unquote modern technology is that via text or email and those kind of things, you can you can keep up, but but you're right, man. It's it's especially on our lower level. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it, the turnover is constant. It, it, the rare and, and the better you're doing, the less it the, the turnover is. If you're not doing real well on the field, I mean, we literally we literally a couple years ago we had a guy drive, you know, ten hours, make a start had a really bad start, gave up seven mm -hmm. runs in the first inning, and mm -hmm. that night he was released. Wow. Um, so, I mean, you better get going yesterday. And that's <laughs> certainly a unique challenge, you know, at our level. Yep. Tom? 40-some years ago, baseball chapel, I was their itinerant. So I do the Cubs mm -hmm. this Sunday, the White Sox the next, the Indians, the mm -hmm. Brewers, the Reds, the Pirates, and the Indians. I wow. you know, about 17. I just drive around. When Vince Noss took over, he made mm -hmm. it more linear. Yeah. And so as the chaplain for the White Sox, I was in charge of every minor league chaplain in wow. charge. You know, I, I tried to encourage them in that. Gotcha. Yeah. So it was a little different if they got sent down or if they came up. If they got released, now we're in the same park. You know, how yeah. do you find out? You always met this guy at the stadium. Yep. Now, another another positive, though, of professional baseball. I've coached. I was a head high school coach, a head college coach, and now I've been working with pro baseball for 38 years, is their family. Mm. Um, f first of all, for the guys, you know, to build trust, I always look in their eyes for the little boy. They all yeah. try to have this guard, right? And mm -hmm. you start talking. And when I see that little boy show up, it's a little league game they played or a high school game. It's amazing how many of them go back to their high school, right? Because yep. that was so big back then. You were the center. But the, 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 the wife and the kids, one of the advantages of pro baseball is to reach out and touch them with encouragement, with care. And I especially mess around in a, in a godly way, mess around with their kids. Mm -hmm. I just make them the center. Yeah. And it's, and, and God gives favor that way. No doubt. So it's not at the high school level. Not many of those guys are married sometimes at the college level, but if they are, they typically don't have family yet mm -hmm. at the professional level. When a guy signs and gets some money, one of the first thing he does is marry his high school sweetheart. Not all of them. But they now are a part of that journey. And I think we miss it, guys and gals, if we don't think about the spouse. So that's an advantage with baseball and the long season. Some people see that as a disadvantage, but you have a lot more touches, 30 spring training, 162 regular in the playoffs. That's really good. Really good. Yep. Uh, you kind of spun into the next thing, and that's talking about unique opportunities that come along with ministry and baseball. What's the hard part of that is sometimes that long, long schedule. That's one of the advantages, as you just mentioned, is you have lots more time to build in depth of relationship and watch things unfold. What are some other opportunities that come along uniquely in baseball? Well, Andy. I'll start, Randy, if that's Thank okay. you. And I'll let you piggyback off of me this time. Because Sounds I, good. Thank you. Yeah, no, I have coached at all three levels. In high school, you're kind of like their master, right? <laughs> you've got the kids you get and they come out and you have more time with them than their dad ever had with them. Yeah. And so you have opportunity if they're Christian or not to model Christ mm -hmm. and to hopefully have a study because it was a public school. I do it off campus or off <laughs> grounds uh, at the college level. You recruit the kids. So, mm -hmm. you know, their parents. So now that adds another dynamic to it. Uh, you only see their parents at some of the games, depending on how far away you recruited them from, and they have dorm life. So again, there are more touches possibly. And at the professional level, like we've talked about already, a long season, it's just a matter of, you know, uh, how are you not here? I am. You mentioned that Roger, mm -hmm. you really have to find out how they're doing, not just spiritually, but physically, emotionally and sleep. If they're tired and you make them get up, uh, the skipper may call you in and say, dude, we had a night game and you had a 10 o'clock study and that guy didn't show up for the next three days. So yes, man. I hope that answers some of that. Yeah. Randy? I think hopefully you all are out there kind of getting a wide variety of perspective 
you're getting a, on the major league level you and, and high school and college Tom where Roger and I are at these guys uh, these guys are, are are mostly single there are a few that are married and they're living in host families mm -hmm. and you talk about an a unique opportunity of not only being a minister to the players but to the family and families that these guys are staying with and I would say that um, over the 21 years, there was a bond that we had as uh, as host families out there at the ballpark. Now, I I personally wasn't one, but they they knew who I was. They knew I was always there. And if their guy was struggling, they knew who to contact. If their family was struggling, they knew who to contact. And so that aspect is very um, unique at that level of baseball to the, relate to the player but also to the family that they are staying with. And let me, Tom. let me throw in too, especially at the high school and collegiate level, you don't have the fan base and the pressure and all that you have at the major league, even the minor league level, right? And so um, it, it really is a different, as Randy mentioned, each level is a little different and uh, there are different dynamics for that. But at the high school and the collegiate level, you're kind of the uh, redheaded stepchild, if you will, of sports. You know, I know there's cross country in those too, but football and basketball, man, they get it. So to give these kids attention is really mm -hmm. special to let them know that their giftedness is special because from working at all three levels, they work maybe just as hard. Mm -hmm. I don't care if they're high school or NAI. Now college is a little harder. Uh, but NAIA or Division One, they all work hard. It's just that the amount of get talent they have. And so to see each of these individuals is very special, does something to them because most people are, oh, you play baseball. When do you guys play? And if it's in the Midwest, ah, it's too cold. I'm not coming out there. You, mm -hmm. have, you have blanket day or coat day so I can stay warm, right? And that's the girlfriends. <laughs> yep. When I started serving our collegiate baseball team, uh, Division I baseball here at Southern Illinois University, uh, I was talking with the coach and trying to paint some parameters about, okay, coach, where may I go? Where may I not go? I said, he was, we were talking about various things. And I said, coach, can I come? Can I be on the field at batting practice? Because uh, I said, that's where I get most relationship developed. And he said, absolutely. So for the first couple of months, I was out there at BP and I had a blast meeting guys, talking with them about just idle chatter that goes on on a baseball field. Let me get inside their lives more than the formal stuff I was doing with them in the locker room, in the in the clubhouse. It was so much better because it helped me integrate uh, who I am with who they are on the field, and it really clicked. Other things that you think are unique opportunities. Go ahead, Tom. Well, the road. When I was uh, with the Sox, I'd go on three or four road trips, and I'd try to keep them close to home. So Detroit, uh, well, mm -hmm. I did get out to KC and, and Texas, but I don't didn't go to uh, the big cities where the wives came along, right? But I would have once a year in my room rip the chaplain. And I would go in there and get all the hell raisers and everybody else and say, dude, you got one chance. This is your time to tell me why I'm an idiot. And it is crazy. And it was amazing. I'd get guys to come, you know, and I can't tell all the things I shared because I became uh, like one of them at some level in terms of talking about real stuff. Yeah. And a lot of it was around the sexual, you know, because mm -hmm. saying, hey, what about this guy? He comes to chapel and look what he's doing and all mm -hmm. that kind of. I loved it. Mm -hmm. Now, people have told me part of my gift mix is um, apostle and evangelist. So not every chaplain's going to fit into that. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, there was one major league team that uh, I was looking at, or baseball chapel was, and the player said, we only have one Christian. We don't need a chaplain. We need an evangelist. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm, do that. I'm your guy. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the, I didn't, the, the, the other guy didn't agree with that. But wow. that, that's another thing. Don't forget the non-believers. I call them pre-believers. Yeah. Because they're looking. They act like they got it all together at age 18 to 25, right? Mm -hmm. And those guys that have been in the big leagues a few years, we all know probably testimonies of guys that said, I thought this was it. So don't dismiss the non-believer. And he actually pray about having a uh, evangelistic night or whatever. And don't call it that, by the yeah, way. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Just rip the chaplain is what I would call it. Yeah. 
in, at the university, we I would do with one with another campus minister. And we called it Stump the Chump. Just there bring you your hardest questions. Come on. Let's talk about anything you want to talk about. Yeah. Good. Along that same kind of line, one of my favorite stories, and, I'll, and I'll, I need to shorten it down some. Uh, the, the second year we were in existence, we hosted the All-Star Game. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened uh, that they uh, that our team asked me to, you know, to come and to, to say the prayer for meals. I said, man, anytime you got a meal and need somebody to pray, let me know. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, I was kind of sitting off to myself. And actually, most we had a good first half as we had a bunch of guys in the All-Star Game, most of them not chapel goers. So I was kind of eating over to my meal. And uh, one of the guys said, well, preach, why don't you come join us? Which is exactly what I wanted, but on their terms, not mine. Yeah. So I come over and we're eating. We're just kind of talking about stuff. And um, and they so, uh, so they said, uh, preach, um, have you ever been really drunk? <laughs> I said, well, no, guys, that's that's not something that's a part of me, not, not a part of my life. And I, one of the guys went to the same university that I went to. And I said, I went to, you know, Southwest Missouri State, now Missouri State. He goes, yeah, man, party time. And, uh, and so we're sitting around and we're shooting this stuff about, you know, you know, booze and girls and baseball. And, and that night, the team had hired some bud girls to walk around to take some pictures. Well, I'm sitting there and this girl comes over and I need to say she's, she's very attractive. And I feel this elbow in my ribs from the guy next to me. He goes, preach is it okay to look <laughs> you talk about being on the spot <laughs> i said what am i going to say now i said yeah just don't stare <laughs> and what's interesting is the next sunday we happened to have a home game and all of those guys came to chapel there you go now i'm not going to tell you that they all make professions of faith in christ but i at least now know that one time in their life they had a chance to hear about Jesus, and it was because of a conversation that was anything but spiritual, so to speak. <laughs> I think, Randy, my difference would be let me stare, and then I'll let you know in about three. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Um, similar things. I, I find all the time players will test you. Coaches will test you to find out what you're made of. And uh, maybe my first year with the club, um, we were, it was raining outside and it was, it was, um, pregame and I'm sitting in the coach's locker room with a hitting coach and he's wrapping tape around a bat for one hand hitting and he's tape and he's telling stories. And I pretty soon into the story with all the F bombs and all the sort of all the stories he was telling, I know he's testing me and I'm just sitting there kind of acknowledging his stories and waited for him to pause. And finally, he paused, and I kind of leaned in, and I said, Ralph, I'm 55 years old. You're probably not going to shock me. It's okay. I'm not going to condemn you either. Relax. And he goes, okay, that was it, and we're good. We're golden ever since. But he needed to know that I'm not just going to be religious boy and pull some act on him. And that's, mm -hmm. boom, that started our great relationship that continues today. Now, but other opportunities that you guys see are unique to baseball at any of the levels we've been talking about. Well, uh, at the, uh, again, for high school and college, the fan base wasn't that great. And I was in the dugout, but as the chaplain, uh, I often stayed for the game for about five innings, just because, mm -hmm. well, first I got free tickets. So that's always <laughs> nice. That's helpful. But they, they would sit me in the wives and the family section. And uh, I have a number of stories, which I won't tell you right now. Of all of a sudden, out of the blue, I had ministry because I, I tell the players always, if you get benched, look to your left and to your right. There's some reason that you're a spiritual guy sitting on the bench that day. I know you want to play. Mm. But the same thing uh, when chapel's over and I get my seat right behind home plate, which I used to think this is awesome. And now well, I haven't for the last couple of years, but I didn't even want to really be there. I wanted to drive home. I, I was two and a half hours from the stadium, wow. uh, but I would sit there and I developed relationships with the vendors, with the guys that are the police, the $10, you know, rent a cops that were watching to make sure you didn't move the seats. And then the wives, which I never would have had opportunity to meet if I hadn't sat there and seen that as a ministry opportunity. Exactly. Good. Yep. Randy. 
Uh, probably along that same kind of line, uh, you must be speaking of, you know, of the vendors on minor league baseball, um, the general manager and all the other front office people are out there um, milling around, you know, and about. And when they see you there, they uh, uh, all the time, they they begin developing relationships with you. And along with some former players, uh, I have done I have done officiated wedding ceremonies of front office people because of the relationship that was built with them. So it's, you never, you never know, you never know and who's watching and uh, who wants to be a part. And it's important to kind of keep your eyes open for all that might be around there. I'd like, yes, Tom. I'd like to piggyback on that guys. Uh, last year I was asked to be the head coach of a small Christian college. And I said, no, I'm too old. I'm 71. But I said, uh, I'll be in a, I'll, I'll be a co-head coach. So they put me in the dugout because of my gray hair, right? And uh, with the guy that's the now head coach. So I get a year of training him. I did five weddings this fall. <laughs> five <laughs> weddings, wow. which meant five premarital. I make them come yeah. for three, at least three premarital. And mm -hmm. so to have, I just got chicken skin thinking about that, to have mm -hmm. continued ministry on top of the coaching side of it. And I share that as you have Christian coaches at the high school or collegiate level, as they are more outspoken about their faith, these guys, when push comes to shove, are going to know where to go because they love, typically love their coach. If they don't, they transfer, right? Unless you're in high yeah. school. That's really, really good. Hey, as we're we kind of bridged into the next thing. I wanted to talk with you about what maybe are some of the most effective strategies and methods, resources, that sort of thing that you've used in ministry and baseball. Probably baseball chapel's number one thing across all these years has been the Sunday home baseball chapel uh, that occurs on Sundays at the ballpark. Uh, tell me about that experience with you and then other things that have been effective in your uh, experience, please. Randy, go for it. Okay. Um, I always make sure with the Sunday chapel notes that I print out a mm -hmm. bunch of those. Mm -hmm. Enough for every player, whether they come to chapel or not, for the home team as well as the visiting team. A couple of reasons. One is for the guy who is there, he not only gets to hear the word, but he also gets to take the written word with him. Yeah. So he gets kind of a a double whammy, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But there are a number of guys I know that would like to come to chapel, but maybe afraid of some, what some of their buddies might think. Mm -hmm. So if you leave some stuff in the locker room or have the clubby put it in there, and they can on their own, if they choose to grab something that they can read on the bus or we can read back at their room, you know, at their host family, that is, a, that is a huge thing to be able to have available that I'm so glad Baseball Chapel does. In reference to the Bible studies outside of that, probably, at least for me and my personality, the one thing that I ask our players who come are, I, I will always bring something that is relevant and practical, but most importantly, I would like for this time to be a time where you get a chance to ask questions you get a chance to kind of set the agenda. Mm -hmm. Now, if none of you guys bring anything, I've got something, but here is your chance to let them ask questions and for you to be able to respond on the spot or for some of them to say, you know what? I need to do some more research in that next week or two weeks from now when we get back together. So that's kind of my mm -hmm. thing. I have my own study, so to speak, I'll bring, but always make it available for questions so that they feel like that they have a part of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Good, Tom. One of the things I did for a while is I would take my business card and on the back of it, put the three points that I spoke on because at the professional level, major league, these guys are in and out. I may see the Royals and then not see them again all year, yeah. but they have something in their hand that I don't say, Hey, be in touch with me because they have all kinds of people that want in, in, you know, right. So I would do that. So kind of like you, Randy, I didn't give out the whole thing. Uh, I did with one player every week that would never come to chapel and I'd put it on my three by five cards and give them to him when I left. But another thing, now this was at the Christian college. And so however this breaks down, if you're at a secular school or whatever, I did a Bible study once a week 
Now there, everybody had to attend, right? Mm -hmm. And not all were Christians. Mm -hmm. And in that context, I picked out five elders, I call them. And uh, those guys met every week with five guys or six on the team to say, what didn't you understand about what Tom talked about? Wow. It could go spiritual, it could go anyway. And then I would meet with them an hour before I'd speak at the next one to get feedback from them because they are going to be your greatest assets at may, other than the word of God and the Holy Spirit. Now, sure. Please understand, I know that. But, but they're going to be in the dorm with them. They're going to be, and believe me, the five guys I picked, uh, some of them were believers just by that much. And I knew it, you know, <laughs> but it was now... Not putting pressure on them, but opportunity is what I saw to say, guys, you have a chance to be a leader here off the ball field. Not all of them were great players. Um, so that those are a couple things that uh, I found out. And again, at the, at the state schools, I don't know how that plays out. Um, but it, let's say you have a Bible study off and you only have five guys show up. You have one guy be your apprentice, if you will. Mm -hmm. Very good. The Thanks. other thing I would add along that kind of line, Roger, talking about the opportunities and strategies. Um, and I know that I know not every place can do this. Uh, again, tenure certainly helps. Mm -hmm. But we each year we had a faith and family night at the ballpark. Mm -hmm. And the ownership group allowed me to basically have the pregame mm -hmm. on the field. And this was an opportunity for players and I would pick out one or two. Um, and, and one of the things I found with athletes is this, they do a whole lot better in an interview style versus handing them the microphone and say, you got 10 minutes, go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. interviews work best. Yeah. They're used to answering questions. Mm -hmm. And I would tell them the questions in advance mm -hmm. so that they wouldn't feel like here they are in front of thousands of people to, that they're gonna be on the spot. So they, so they knew what was coming. Mm -hmm. But still an opportunity for them to now be front and center. The guy, people see them on the baseball field. They see how they react. And now they get a chance to hear verbally about their faith in God. Mm -hmm. And that was a great opportunity for some of our guys to be able to make that kind of the next step of being more than just a good teammate, which is the most important. But now to our fans to be able that they get a chance to hear from them. And that was a neat thing that we had a chance to do. Yes, sir. Tom. Great. A great resource are all of Roger's books. There, how is that? You're very, <laughs> very lot. kind. Thank I you. I never told the players that, but I really. <laughs> Roger, that's very true. Yeah. Very true. That's funny. One of the things, it's an ongoing thing that I've been doing with our clubs <laughs> for years is I'll uh, give them copies of a daily devotional. A lot of them don't have anything. It happened to be mine, but I would give them that and we would discuss what we'd read for the last week when we get together on a homestand. We'd pick one right after BP on one day out of the homestand, we would sit and discuss what we've been reading in our devotional reading. And I also send them a text message of uh, a, a verse from the Proverbs every day, whatever day of the month it was, I would send them that. And I continue to do that, whether they're playing with us now or they did years ago, the guys that are in my phone, I keep sending them scripture every single day. Uh, they've been, some of them gone for years, but I stay in touch with them that way, Tom. Uh, dealing with social media, UPI.org, the organization I used to be with, they put out a thing called Digging In. It's five-minute video, and if you go to their website, it, it's primarily made for the players, right? Good. And uh, before that, they had another thing that was primarily for the players, they ended up having 50,000 followers. So wow. God really uses, like you're saying, the media, the uh, social media, I should say, but it's called digging in. Now, all of the UPI guys are former professional players, so they have some clout, especially mm -hmm. if you're a high school or collegiate coach or chaplain. Uh, they're really good. And uh, the, the most recent player is Hochaver, who used to be with the Royals. So some of you are Kansas City people. I'm guessing, that, especially since you're wearing a chef's uniform, I figured. <laughs> <that's> <laughs> okay, that was UPI.org? Yes, and okay. it's called digging in. Good, good. Uh, Tony Graffinino, Hochow, yeah. all these Hochover, they're former players and they're they're breaking down the word of God. It's not talking baseball. Very good. One thing, one group that goes untouched often in ministry and sport is often the third team that's on the field, and that's the umpires. And one of the hmm. things that I've really taken, I mean, I was an official for wrestling for 13 years and 
worked really hard at it and saw it as a form of ministry for me. And so I know how conscientious a lot of the umpires are about how they do it. They want to be professionals. They want to do a great job. And so when I go in and uh, after doing two chapels with the home and visiting team, I'll go see the umpires. And often I've given them, I've left a, a handout for them earlier in the day, but then I go in and I'll stand there and pray with the umpires and ask them about for what can I pray for you? And I'll pray with them and go on. And as, as they come back, they say, well, Hey, we always know when we come here, we're going to get cared for. And I'm like, Good. Yeah. Tom, did I see a hand? Yeah. A resource for that. Uh, many years ago, Teddy Barrett, who's been a major league umpire for 20 some years came to me and said, I'd like to start a UPI, but for umpires. Brilliant. So he has an organization calling for Christ and it's calling for Christ, God, calling for Christ. And I say that because as you think of ministering to your umpires, that would be a great resource for them. Brilliant. What Teddy does is every year he has a retreat and he has about 50 professional umpires from every level, minor wow. league, big, and they come in and it's a, uh, <laughs> it's a Southern Baptist retreat, baby. It's in a chapel and they preach the word at them. And mm -hmm. these guys are used to, they want to know black and white, right? They got that yep. 17 inches, which is really 21 inches, which is a picture <laughs> I hope is 23 inches. They want that. And uh, Teddy gives it to him. Teddy is, has his, uh, he's ordained, has a master's of theology. And this site is legit. So as you think about umpires, that, and then the, when you said third team, mm -hmm. I, I really want to speak to the guys that are not playing, the guys that are not good enough. Man, yeah. they're looking for somebody to say, do I have worth? And they're battlers, you know, they fought hard. So good point on the umpires calling for Christ if you guys want to check that out. Very good. We'd probably Google that and find their website. Yeah. Good. Good. Probably callingforchrist.com, just a guess, or dot org. Sure, but sure. I've gotcha. Mm -hmm. Randy, any follow up to those ideas? No, I, I do what the umpire sings uh, is really good. It's one of those things, at least my own experience. Um, being here in St. Louis on a minor league level, the vast majority of the umpires that are here are local guys anyway. Mm -hmm. In your area and a lot of the other areas in our in our in our league, a lot of guys come in for the weekend and they're mm -hmm. and they've been traveling all week. And sometimes the emphasis, you're right. Sometimes we kind of either forget about it or minimize that. And I think you're right. That's a very very important part that they feel like that they're a part of 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 what's going on as well. Sir, Tom. Say is, one of the things that Tom and you have talked about, you keep in track of contact with guys over the years. I Just something that I started about seven or eight years ago. I wish I had started sooner. I didn't think of it sooner. Mm -hmm. I Every month, I have a monthly email that I send out to guys, uh, just kind of what's going on in life kind of deal. Uh, I have a, a Bible reading guide for the month. And uh, I've got about 180 guys right now wow. on that list. And uh, it's just another way and it's interesting sometimes i'll get emails from guys that it's been a long time since mm -hmm. i've heard from them or seen them hey rev thanks for keeping us on the list we remember those days and it brings back good memories thank you very much you never you never know brilliant the yep. word oh. doesn't return void right never. the fourth fan and head coaches hate this fan the parents yeah. they don't mm -hmm. hate them but I've been in a lot of environments, a lot of dugouts, college and high school level where they're like, oh, Jamie, that guy's here again. Well, if you or if there's an assistant coach who's a believer can be that go between, mm. because first of all, they love their kid more than anybody and they don't or they don't love their kid. I've been in that situation where I've had to come in and say, man, simmer down on your son, man, and just have ministry to them. Mm -hmm. If they know you love their kid and you're working with them, that's great. But all of a sudden, um, the last year, the, the team I had coached for asked me to come on their spring trip. So guess where I sat? In the stands with all the parents. Wow. Those people stay in touch with me. Yeah. And they, they are people, too. And they're supposed to have their chi together, right? They don't. And no. some of them that do need to let you know that they do because now they're sharing their faith. So I appreciate the third fan, the umpire, but the fourth team, yeah, fourth team. parents, man, yeah, very at good. the pro level too, at the pro level, because yeah. the son, just like the wife, whenever I meet a player, I talk <clears> to his <throat> wife, not because I'm hitting on her, but because she is not, she's that second chair, you know, and they kind of light up. 
And I saw a name that many of you would know if you're a Cubs fan in a, in a, in a airport that he never came to chapel. I know of, and he was with his wife. And I said, Hey dude, what's up? He goes, Hey, I go, is this your wife? Yeah. And I didn't talk to him for the next 10 minutes. <laughs> she was move. glowing. And then afterwards he said to me, he pulled me aside, said, thank you. Mm-hmm. So there's so many dynamics in this game with all the travel and the schedule and everything different than football and basketball. Yep. And yet some the same. Excellent. Yep. One last thought here, because you guys have, uh, Tom in particular, experienced baseball on a bunch of different levels. I'd like to ask you about similarities or differences uh, between professional baseball, collegiate, high school, club baseball. What might be the similarities or differences that are pronounced uh, in those various levels related to how we serve them? Randy, go for it. Well, I'm going to say I, I have done it professionally, so to speak, only at, at the professional level. I, I personally have not done the high school um, mm-hmm. or the college level. I'm well acquainted with those kinds of things and opportunities along that kind of line uh, that certainly do um, do exist there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I, I would say that um, the, the, the aspect of the parent, I mean, just kind of kind of tie into that because um, boy, those parents have a lot invested mm-hmm. and, and they feel it and they, and they feel the success and they feel the failure sometimes. And so I think it's important. We've already hit on it pretty hard, but I think that that aspect of, of relationship with the parents would be something. Tom, I think this is an area you probably have a lot more experience. I'm going to let you kind of take the ball um, on this one. Thanks a lot. Appreciate that. Uh, I'll get you next time we're on. Here. There you go. I think uh, trying to think of it at the high school level, whether you're the coach or the chaplain, these kids respect you at some level more than, well, maybe not behind your back. They don't, but they have a little more understanding that you're an authority and I may get to play mm-hmm. more if I listen to you. Uh, <laughs> and so I think that's important. They don't always have the same brain width. We won't call it bandwidth, but to understand uh, everything that you might want to tell them. So remember, you know, I, I use a golfing analogy. See where the ball lies before you pick your club. Uh, you know, when you're dealing with these high school kids in particular, mm-hmm. but they are rebounds typically. Some of them come to faith, and some of them want studies when they're 17 or 18. But they become rebounds when they're 28, and their marriages aren't working or whatever. At the collegiate level, these kids are now out on their own and they've heard it from their parents and they, it's a little different animal as you guys working with collegiate players understand. Until they get to a place where they really ask the questions, it's tough to get audience because of that, which is different than the pro level. Mm. Uh, At the pro level, this is their job. And, you know, us walking in there, it's just like walking into a factory and saying, hey, I'm the chaplain. We have to be very respective of not only the organization, but that this is their livelihood. And when they get released, it's really hard to get picked up by another team unless they're a big league veteran and somebody needs them down the stretch. Mm -hmm. Their identity is gone. And as I mentioned in the beginning, that was me. That drove me to Jesus. When the Giants released me, I was just crushed for about a year. Hmm. And still my identity, I'd wear my warm-up jacket, you know, wow. and stuff like that, yeah. because I thought this is what I was going to be. And that's when I came to faith, when somebody reached out to me, it just happened. Oh, let's talk about this one, guys. I forgot. My Good. girlfriend led me to Christ. Uh, about that. Unbelievable. She was wow. one of those horrible missionary daters, right? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so hopefully she dated me for more than that. Oh, by the way, we've been married 50 years now. But uh, the girlfriend, the girlfriend, the girlfriend at the collegiate or the professional level. Mm-hmm. And then there's a whole other dynamic. I remember one time walking in Minnesota into the hotel. We were staying there. And I met a guy and I said, Hey, I never met your wife. He was with somebody. He goes, you still, ha- you still have it. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> so wow. there are all kinds of levels of girlfriend, wife, you know, whatever road it's beef, just, whatever mm-hmm. you want to call it, but mm-hmm. to be available to them, not to be, Oh, you look at you, you know? Yep. Good. Now, if you're uh, listening in and you want to ask a question directly of these guys related to ministry and baseball, this would be the time we have just a few minutes left. 
Um, fire away. Go ahead, Dave. Um, yeah, I served eight, Roger knows, eight years as the chaplain for the Iowa Cubs, AAA affiliate years ago. And one of the, that was, that was pre-cell phone days. So just so you go to how long ago that was, but um, <laughs> what have you done with, uh, one of the best things we did was when Baseball Chapel came out with the Hispanic mm -hmm. Bible. And I remember uh, the wives and things, um, Carlos Zambrano, some of you guys may mm -hmm. remember when he came in, he had some decent English. His wife spoke no English. Yeah. The best thing we I served, the best way I served him was to find him a Hispanic church See. that could really serve his wife, especially when he was out of town. So what have you what's your been experience there with with that kind of dynamic? Would you get a lot of those young guys that come up from Dominican or wherever they're coming that have very little, if any, English? Very excellent pregunta. Gracias. Say, excellent point. Um, uh, I think Chapel's done a wonderful thing because now every major league team has a Hispanic and a English speaking chaplain since I believe it's 34% of major league baseball is Hispanic. It is rough when you can't speak the language. And I think that uh, printed materials are about the only way I could go anyway, by giving them a track that has been or a booklet or whatever. But that's a huge need, and I appreciate you bringing that up. Good. Randy? Well, and especially on our level as well, um, not every one of our teams um, has somebody bilingual like Roger or somebody or has, has a um, two chaplains, uh, as, uh, English and a Spanish, although many of them do. That, that's the goal. That's mm -hmm. our hope. What we then do then is when those guys come, we make sure we tie in to those uh, people in our community or other players who are uh, with them or who can speak that language fluently, who can be able uh, to tie in with them and be able to help them uh, feel at home. But yeah, that certainly is an important thing to have both the English and Spanish, especially amongst the other languages. Mm -hmm. Tom? Quick story. I was doing a major league chapel. The guy introduced me. I got done. And, and he goes, good job. I go, great. You think they liked it? He goes, no. He said, none of them spoke English. I go, what? Why didn't you tell me that at the beginning? This was back before so, right? Uh, that's yeah. funny. And we just laughed walking out of the locker room. I'm like, dude, <laughs> I just wasted all that time. Well, uh, <laughs> so ask before, you yeah, know, if they speak English or not. That's funny. A few years ago, I was standing by the cage at BP and guys are hitting balls and one guy comes out of the thing and I said, Nico, como estas? Uh, you know, de, de donde usted? You know, and all that. And he says, uh, I don't speak Spanish. I said, your name is Nico Vasquez. How do you not speak Spanish? He's, dude, I'm from Vegas. I don't, <laughs> <he's great."> exactly. <laughs> exactly. But often. it's funny, though, when I speak to the Latino players in their home tongue, it opens hearts just like that. It gives me an immediate opening that goes really quickly to their hearts. Yeah, Tom. One of the biggest ministries I had to Latino players is I would go to the Dominican and to Puerto Rico. And I know everybody can't do that every year. Okay. And I don't care if they were believers or going to hell in a handbasket. When they saw me in spring training, they would come up because in God's economy, I had favor to be in the dugout and I'm the yeah. feet. And uh, I had one situation. I walked into the uh, locker room and I saw a player that was with the Astros. This was in Caguas or somewhere in the in Puerto Rico. And he goes, my friend, how you do? And I go, great. He goes, hey, everybody, we're in the locker room. He goes, put your glove down. We're doing chapel. This is my friend. <laughs> this guy's not a believer. I'm like, what am I going to speak? And if I name the name of the players, I'll name one, Don Mattingly, uh, yeah. that were around that room that were young players right yeah. all of a sudden they're looking at me with disdain and i so i thought <laughs> I share the gospel but because you went to them yeah. and it's, as as ministers if you go to their home even if you don't know their language mm -hmm. it plays out huge yeah because especially in that culture relationship is so important man yep so yep. for those of you that don't speak the language there's even a way one final thing with dave um in the baseball chapel material we can download um you can either take the english version you can take a spanish ling language version or i take both and and i i put the bilingual so half of 
The handout is in English, the other half is in Spanish. So the same handout is useful in both languages. And then I, I will just usually greet all the Latino players and then we'll do chapel primarily in English, but then I may explain something to a Latino afterward, but um, just to be able to go one step further. Uh, but it's if never, we're better prepared than we were back then, Dave. Yeah, and if you ever get a chance to meet or write to Vince Noss or Cisco, those two guys have done yeah. a wonderful job of understanding the need of chaplains. Yep. Yeah, I think um, just in the number of years, eight or nine, that I've been serving with Baseball Chapel, I've seen things grow and develop in, in excellent ways. Yeah. Any final thoughts? Any further uh, questions? We're about to wrap things up. Go ahead, Bob. Two things. One, an observation, especially working with college, is that you have to realize, too, that when you're walking a baseball field, especially practice, a lot of times you're walking by the softball diamond. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be open that, you know, that softball coach may be looking for something, too. Absolutely. So that's it. The other thing, I have a question for those two. A, a friend of mine was involved with, you know, baseball ministry mm -hmm. with uh, in the major leagues, and he talked about the, the, the actual baseball ministry has a, a set of beliefs. Does that sound right? Yeah. That, that you have to follow yep. in doing their ministry. Is that true? Yes. There As is this, definitely a core, there is a, there are, there, there are certainly core beliefs that are absolutely minimally essential in order for somebody to be considered a chaplain. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, FCA does as well. Here, here's our core right. set of beliefs and most ministries kind of paint the parameters of what they're, uh, ministry is and baseball chapels among them. Yeah. Any final thoughts from Tom and or uh, Randy? Tom, how about you go first? Softball line. I've become good friends with a lady named Leah Amico, and she's a three-time gold medalist. And she has written a devotional. Uh, and I can't remember the name of it, but if you Google Leah Amico, it, it's really good. It's, um, it's very softball relatable. And uh, so just a, a resource for you guys. Yeah, she has done a great job. I met her doing a softball clinic years ago. Genuine article, really yep. solid. Yeah, Randy? Availability, relationship, be yourself. Yeah. So often we try to be somebody that we're not. And if you're around a team long enough, they will, they will find that out. They will sniff you out. Exactly. So be yourself. <laughs> Be available. Don't just be one of those who shows up during chapel time and not any other time. And 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 build relationships, and God God will honor and God will bless. Right along that same line, don't be afraid to make mistakes. I got in an argument with a player in a big league locker room, and we went at it nose to nose. And I thought, dang nabbit, I'm done. It turned out to be tremendous ministry. I mean, those players were up against their lockers. They're like, what the heck? This is the chaplain doing this stuff? Mm. And uh, I had to come back and ask for forgiveness. And so I think that's something these players mm. don't understand. The power of forgiveness yeah. and asking for it publicly. Mm -hmm. It just broke some of these guys. Yeah. And so I, I, I challenge you right along with what you said, Randy. Be yourself. And if you're not perfect, guess what? They're going to go. Huh, he's not perfect. He's a real dude. He's real. Yeah. yeah. That's it. I mean, sports people in general and maybe baseball players in particular can smell a phony a mile away. And uh, it just like my friend tested me in that little locker room one day, he was going to test me and find out what, whether I was just playing some game or not. And uh, if, if we prove ourselves authentic, it goes a long way. Uh, Dave Turnbull, I put that uh, name in the chat. I hope you saw that. Yep. And uh May I please ask, Rick Radcliffe, would you, sir, uh, pray to wrap things up today? Thanks very much to our guests, Tom Roy, Randy Curlis. You guys have been excellent uh, resources to us today. Dear Lord, we thank you today for the words of encouragement and the knowledge of these two people that agreed to help others get started in this. We also today are looking forward to the Christmas star and the hope that that may bring. And we pray for all of us that that hope will be the sustaining peace that gets us through the, through the year and started on a new one. 
In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks so much. Appreciate Thank you, it, Roger. Guys. Yeah, bless you. We'll see you all in January sometime, all right? Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks again.